Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the Medical Center Hour, the spring 2017 series of Medical Center Hour programs. This is the first. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here in the School of Medicine, and I'm delighted to see all of you here today. Um, I'd like to welcome you on a day that feels, frankly, like um, maybe the first day of spring outside. I'm sure that's a, that's a, um, a tease, but um, it's nice to have it nonetheless. Um, our program today is called Clinician's Ear, Learning to Listen. This is also the Jesse Stewart Richardson Memorial Lecture, created at UVA School of Medicine in 1999 which remembers Mrs. Richardson, whose untimely, untimely death nearly 20 years ago was a result of tragic, adverse events in her care at this hospital. Her long career as a school teacher prompted her family to invest funds in medical education so that upcoming generations of health professionals at UVA might know better how to care for patients, uh, how to give care that has that has the patient at its heart, and how to explain and explore without fear medical mistakes when they occur. This afternoon, as every year, we welcome to our lecture Mrs. Richardson's son, Dr. Don Richardson. This year, also, we're delighted to welcome Mrs. Richardson's granddaughter, Donna, and her great-granddaughter, Rachel. And Rachel also happens to have uh, moved into the health professions uh, also as a nurse. Welcome to all of you. Uh, we acknowledge uh, today with this lecture both the Richardson family's loss and their generous gift and their ongoing collaboration with us. These annual lectures constitute an evolving conversation on a couple of themes that have considerable currency. One theme, medical error and patient safety, has been addressed several times in recent years at this lecture by leading experts. Another theme, right from the start, has been attention to the patient. Indeed, attention to the patient as the doctor's or nurse's teacher. And uh, this year's lecture, Clinician's Ear, is about that kind of attention because listening is arguably at the heart of what transpires between patient and clinician. Amid today's data deluge, checklists, business buzzwords, and the demanding pace of clinical practice, are we still listening to the patient? And how do we listen, at the bedside or in the clinic, so that we hear what is important, and so that the patient feels heard and known and truly cared for? And how do we listen to one another and ourselves and learn more about the potential healing nature of both our words and our attentive silence? We're really proud today to welcome the 2017 Richardson lecturer, Dr. John Coulihan, Emeritus Professor of Medicine and former director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. A longtime practitioner and teacher of internal medicine, Dr. Coulihan, who's known as Jack, is co-author of a respected text on the medical interview. But he's also a poet uh, who recently published his sixth book of poems, The Wound Dresser. There are copies of this um, outside the auditorium provided by UVA Bookstore. These are available for sale, and, and Jack would also be happy to sign books. Um, that book just came out last fall. Um, we'd like to welcome Jack, and considering that we have someone so accomplished as a listener and a thoughtful teacher of attentive doctoring and a wordsmith, I'd say we're all ears. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Marcia. Um, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm particularly honored uh, to be giving the Richardson Lecture uh, today, uh, the theme, as Marcia mentioned, of listening to patients, paying attention uh, to what you're doing, listening to your colleagues, to your heart, uh, in a sense reflecting uh, on the practice that you're engaged in 
is really what I want to uh, discuss today. I have to step over here. The, when we first think of listening in medicine, the first thought that came to my mind, of course, is the stethoscope. Um, and the stethoscope for 200 years, and I should mention that uh, René Lenec invented the stethoscope in 1817. So this is the 200th anniversary of the stethoscope. And here he is, evidently, he has a stethoscope in his left hand, but he's using the old technique rather than the new technology by listening directly uh, to the patient's chest. Now those of you who are experienced clinical ears out there, um, can you identify that heart sound? That's a diastolic rumble. Uh, very difficult. At least it was very difficult for me as a student. In this case, I have uh, I was planning to have a plural rub, but I got another rumble. <laughs> so that goes to show you that you can't always depend on your clinical ear. Uh, but I think the more contemporary problem, even though the stethoscope is now an icon of medicine, and the stethoscope over the neck is kind of a, uh, almost an emoji for uh, medical practice, uh, a more important and I think much more difficult clinical skill is listening to the patient. And although I want to begin by saying that I acknowledge the fact that many, many physicians have excellent clinical ears in that respect, and hopefully most of us in this room do as well, we have to admit that there's a problem today, a problem that is widespread, causes a lot of dissatisfaction, a lot of incorrect, misleading diagnoses and treatment, and that is, and I think, medical error. And I think that is our inability to listen carefully to our patients. So today I want to talk about three components of the clinical ear, in a sense. The first, and I think it will take the longest part of our time together, is listening to the patient. The second will be listening to your own heart, in other words, reflective practice. And the third will be the words that you speak, the healing words, the oral component of the therapeutic process. First, we'll talk about listening to the patient. And there's one of many, probably hundreds of aphorisms of Osler, and you can see it there, listening to your patient, he is telling you the diagnoses. I want to go back a little, maybe 30 years before Osler's time to the 1870s, when this man, uh, Anton Chekhov, was a medical student at the Russia State University in Moscow. And when he was a student, he had a preceptor on his kind of hospital clerkship. It was a community hospital that he went out from Moscow to work in. And his preceptor wrote an evaluation, as preceptors still do today. You can see, here's part of the evaluation. He did everything with attention and a manifest love of what he was doing, especially toward patients. He listened 
quietly to them, never raising his voice, however tired he was, and even if the patient was talking about things irrelevant to the illness. Let's fast forward to an American, William Carlos Williams, who, as you know, was a general practitioner slash pediatrician in Patterson, New Jersey for almost 50 years, while at the same time he was creating, in essence, uh, a body of poetry that is one of the most prominent uh, poetry uh, collections of the 20th century in the United States, as well as writing novels and other works uh, in addition. He wrote an autobiography toward the end of his life, and these are a couple of quotes when he's talking about his medical practice. In a flash, the details of the case would begin to formulate themselves, and the patient would shape up into a person who called for attention. And this one I really love. The physician enjoys a wonderful opportunity to witness the words being born. We have been the words very parents. On the other hand, we have kind of a dichotomy in medicine today. I think most of us would agree with Oliver Sacks that the first act of medicine is to listen to a personal story. In our hearts, I think this is embedded, in a sense, in our vocation to become physicians. But on the other hand, we have this model that is really widespread of characterized, I think, in its most extreme form by Dr. Gregory House, who not only doesn't listen to patients, he doesn't listen to his colleagues, he doesn't listen to anybody, nor trust anybody except himself. And there is a kind of detachment and lack of trust that has creeped into our profession. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. I ran a narrative medicine elective for fourth year medical students for many years. And one of the things they had to do was to keep a clinical journal for at least 30 days, or, or at least 30 entries. They didn't have to be consecutive days. And in our classes, uh, they would actually have to complete this before the formal course began. And in our classes, we would discuss excerpts from these journals. So I'm going to present a number of these excerpts uh, related to listening uh, to you this afternoon. Here's a student on family medicine. This was my worst rotation by far. My preceptor in the family health center was a big disappointment. She talks a good talk. But wait till you see her in action. She never listens. Another one from oncology. I was totally un unimpressed with the attending's handling of the situation. I felt that his approach lacked empathy. He didn't listen to family members who just found out that their mother had little time to live. Here's another student, fourth year student, who's really making a confession here, uh, saying that I have found my ability to listen to patients has gotten worse. At the beginning of the third year, I allowed patients to speak uninterrupted for as long as they wanted, but with more experience under my belt. I sometimes find myself distracted by my own thoughts while listening to a patient's story. Now, what are the barriers? What, what are the difficulties? We, we agree that the first act of medicine is listening to the patient's story. Uh, and unless we're Dr. House, we don't strongly object to that. But we often don't do it. 
And so what are the barriers that we encounter? And I've clustered them in three groups here. One is the mental traffic jam. Uh, we are preoccupied, we're trying to multitask, uh, we are constantly aware of time constraints, we're thinking about what we need to say next, ask next, do next, uh, and so we can't listen. The second is what I call a lack of motivation, although that might be a little too strong. And it's the issue that we've categorized data into objective data and subjective data. And no matter how we subscribe to the biopsychosocial model and to all the different aspects that we learn as we start the first few years of medical school, we tend to gradually drift toward the belief that objective data, which we define as the things that machines and lab tests produce for us, um, is more important than what the patient says or feels. And so consequently, we don't pay as much attention to that. The third group is what I call emotional baggage. And that's the internal baggage that we carry with us. Our anxiety, our frustration, our anger, uh, disgust, uh, and feelings that we have and that are perfectly natural, but that interrupt our ability to listen. With regard to the first issue, multitasking and mental traffic jam, I decided since this is a medical school and a medical lecture, I had to produce some kind of chart for you. And so this is taken from a, 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 a neuroscience uh, article, and it's just talking about the components of attention, what it involves, what our ability to fixate our attention involves. And I won't try to describe it all because I'll get mixed up and it'll be embarrassing for me. But the bottom line is that attention is a very complex neurological uh, resource that we have. And there are hundreds of articles, studies that show that attempts to multitask invariably decrease performance on all of the tasks involved. Uh, and even though that hasn't gotten through to our culture yet, it's, it's certainly true. And so, um, so the issue of multitasking, uh, of being distracted, uh, is, is a very significant one. One of the other aspects uh, of, of distraction has to do with time. And you hear this all the time from students, from residents, from your colleagues. There just isn't enough time. And I'm reminded of an article that uh, just came out in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And if any of you are internists, you might have seen it not more than a month or two months ago, which was a study across uh, many, many practices of family medicine, primary care, internal medicine, orthopedics, and one other specialty. Basically, it was a time usage study, and they showed that only 29% of the office time, on the average, is spent in direct patient care, whereas 50-some percent is spent fooling around with the electronic medical record and other types of paperwork and so forth. And of course, that's a real problem and one that we can't really address today. But I do like to look at listening as having at least two components. I tell students, if you're worried about time, think of listening as having a vertical component and a horizontal component. 
The vertical component is now, in this moment, I am listening deeply to what is being said. I'm listening, I'm here, I'm connected. The horizontal component has to do with the concept of reconstructing the patient's story over time. And of course there is a valid, I think, objection that we have less time to gather that whole story and put it together in a coherent narrative. I'll say two things about that. One is that that's no excuse for not listening deeply in the vertical dimension. And the other thing is that what time we have, uh, what time we have, uh, we don't often use efficiently. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the very famous study by Beckman and Frankel in 1984 that uh, less than a quarter of patients who come to see their doctor are able to even finish their initial statement before the doctor interrupts them. Uh, and that interruption comes in uh, about 18 seconds after they start talking. Um, Marvel and his co-workers <coughs> reproduced that study <coughs> in exactly the same methodology 15 years later. And this is during the 15 year period when medical interviewing, etc., etc., became very big in medical schools. Uh, and they found essentially the same results. If you want to argue, uh, the doctors waited another five seconds <laughs> before they interrupted the patient. So that raises the issue of uh, even if we have a small amount of time, we seem to be not using it efficiently. We seem to be interrupting and uh, kind of destroying the flow. The second issue is the detachment uh, that is implied by our devaluation of subjective data. Uh, here's a fourth year student who says she was labeled as pain-seeking, a pain-seeking drug addict, simply due to the stereotype associated with right-sided endocarditis. But no one seemed to notice how terrified she was of needles. I was the only one left to listen to her, and I often felt powerless in my protest, patronized for getting too attached to the patient. And this reminds me of a story that some of you may know by Ernest Hemingway uh, called Indian Camp, where the doctor uh, is uh, camping on a lake, and he's called to see an Indian Native American woman who uh, is in severe pain. She's having a very, very difficult labor. And he rows across to her camp, to, to attend to this, and his son is with him. His son is Nick Adams. And his son says, Daddy, you know, she's screaming. What can we do about her pain? And his response is, her screams are not important. I don't hear them. I don't hear them because they're not important. They're subjective. He's interested in the objective features of, in this case, performing a C-section, emergency C-section. Uh, this deaf ear, or unresponsive voice, leads to problems. It leads to inadequate diagnosis, inadequate treatment, and medical error, which again is a theme of this lecture, iatrogenic harm. But sometimes we don't also look at the other side of the story, which is the clinician herself or himself. He's actually harmed by closing off this ability to connect with patients and to listen, to 
understand uh, by becoming more detached as a person and more dissatisfied with their work and eventually succumbing to burnout, which again, as you probably know, is becoming more and more prevalent in medicine. So what do we listen to with the clinical ear? Well, we listen to the words, but we also listen to aspects of language that are um, that sort of kind of surround the words and create the actual language. The, the rate and the rhythm of speech, the pauses and hesitations that patients have, uh, the way they articulate the words, the volume, the pitch, or the tone. And also we listen to the silence. I want to just read you a couple of poems. Uh, and these poems are in the patient's voice. And although there's words, you can hear the words, there are stories that many doctors wouldn't listen to um, or be interested in, but, but I think tell us a lot very important data about the patient. This one has to do with a man who is having a cardiac cath because of a, uh, an episode of uh, uh, angina, unstable angina. And this is in his voice. It's called heart blockages. Those white ragged lines are what's left of my vessels. Damaged legs and old spurs that jostle bareback on that black bull of a heart. My heart, whose flanks on the overhead screen are heaving and faltering. I watch my arteries taper, twist, crimp to a thread in a blockage so tight it's a wonder the front of my heart hasn't died. I remember the rodeo in Wilcox, Arizona, where leaning on a jeep behind the bleachers, I dipped snuff like a cowboy and bragged I could ride all night through the gap in those black mountains. The, here's a man who is remembering his potency, his, his ability to project himself, his competence, his, his imagery of, of himself as a man, and reflecting on that as he looks down the line toward his future. Is this something that we necessarily want to know about our patient. Here's another poem. It's a woman who's talking about her medications. In an open box beside my chair sit vials of poison and the jar of cream I use to smear my scalp. My son comes in to check me out, afraid that I'll forget to take the poison but I won't forget. For heart, I take a white one once. For bowels, a scarlet ball at night. And when I think too much in bed, I take a lavender and green. To keep my heart from beating fast, a poison pill that binds me up. For blood, high blood, I take a brown. For, for blood, high blood, a red and white. For blood, low blood, I take a brown. To make the prostate, actually I, I've got the wrong gender here on my picture, I apologize. <laughs> I didn't think of that when I picked out the picture. Anyhow, imagine, um, to make the prostate work, I take an elephant tablet twice a week. My son brings my seven refills in and asks, if I would like some air. It's warm, he says. Let's get some rays. 
That boy sees poison in my eyes, the poison working through my skin. He wants to hold my hand, but he's afraid. That makes two of us. For heart, I take a white one once. I just want to make one comment about time, as I said before, regarding our inefficiency. Again, there are many clinical books on doctor-patient interaction that point out, and I think effectively, that it doesn't take much time that with active listening, with accurate empathic feedback, focus, priority setting, that we can do a remarkable amount that we can, it's a skill I think that we can gain over time, um, despite the limitations, and I, I'm not in any way minimizing our limitations, our 56% paperwork, etc. Those are important problems that we need to address. But we can't, I think, ignore our patients while we try to address them. I think a second area of listening is listening to your own heart. Um, writers about medicine have been interested in this for at least 250 years. And these are just some quotes. And they bring up two issues. One is that the study of medicine hardens the heart, corrupts the heart, <clears throat> hardens the human heart by which we live. Uh, <coughs> and opposed to that, of course, is a quote from Dr. Gregory House, who is not worried about his heart being hardened. Uh, and some, reject, some um, additional quotations from my students. Uh, we have never been encouraged to look at the assumptions and feelings that the physician brings to the process. I can't believe how arrogant the residents and attendings are. If an emotion creeps into the situation, the attendings deflect it away. One of the things that that have become, has become somewhat popular in recent years is the concept of reflection rounds based on the more generic concept of reflective practice. How can we, in this turbulent time, in our turbulent environment, learn to step back and reflect on what we're doing? Um, at Stony Brook, in each of the clerkships, uh, third year clerkships, the, we students have reflection rounds uh, at least twice in which they, in a small group setting, are able to talk about the, uh, their feelings, their conflicts, their difficulties that they've had with patients or with uh, other members of the team, um, talking about how this makes them feel not just uh, trying to suppress it or speaking about it in cynical, ironic, kind of joking ways, but actually talking about it as genuine human beings, one to another, about the difficulties that they're having. What does it mean? Are we doing this the right way? So reflection runs is one aspect. Another aspect is the concept of narrative medicine. And that I, I'm sure you're all familiar with that concept and its prevalence in the last 20 years or so. But I think sometimes we ignore one dimension of narrative medicine. We focus on that narrative, on that horizontal dimension of listening, so that we get the narrative and we talk about the patient's narrative or make up our own narrative. Um, 
without the vertical dimension of talking about making narrative medicine a habit of the heart, of reflection, rather than just a habit of the mind, learning how to listen and construct a narrative. So the clinical ear, again, this is one of those slides that you see after some guy stands up and talks and tells you a lot of unrealistic things, then he gives you a, a table about how you can solve all your problems. Well, um, this, this may look like that, but it isn't. It's just kind of my own reflection on some of these issues. And I think a key word here uh, is mindfulness. And I'm sure you're familiar with that term. It's a very simple concept that has gained a lot of traction in medicine and hopefully will gain more traction. The ability to just get into that space by clearing your minds with deep breathing or with some other technique that before you walk in to a patient's room that you throw away, discard those other concerns and become mindful of what's going on at that moment. On a more cognitive level, the concept of time management, which I think we haven't really been so good at uh, as physicians in general. Uh, the concept, the, the cult of the objective can only I think be effectively fought by having good clinical role models who demonstrate the necessity to integrate the heart and the mind in caring for patients and who, who can do it so that patient, or students, residents who are skeptical about how can I do this because this is so terrible, you know, I, got so many things to do, I'm so distracted, etc., etc. You know, the world hates me, sees that there are role model physicians who not only are able to do this, but are excellent models of what a good physician should be. And re reflective practice, the idea of reflection rounds, uh, and of course there's reflective, reflective writing as well. Uh, many, many techniques are out there. Um, unrealistic? Well, they're realistic for many physicians, so it, it, I think we should all approach it with the concept that this is possible, it's effective. How can I learn to, to practice reflective medicine? Um, I thought I must, I have to give you a more positive view of my students. So here's one. I have observed a physician who was very kind to his patients, but ruthless to his, well, it's par partially positive, okay, but ruthless to his residents. No doubt he was excellent at what he did and should be congratulated for that. But I do not respect him as a person. I think his actions and words constituted psychological abuse. It is refreshing to find that the majority of physicians I have encountered genuinely, I have encountered genuinely vested in people as human beings. So in this case, it's the majority of physicians she's praising and not the individual person. The last thing I'd like to talk about is our healing voice, and I think we often uh, ignore that. Um, and I'll go back to Anton Chekhov, who um, I didn't really introduce earlier because I assume that you know, aside from being a practicing physician, was one of the greatest world masters 
of short story, right, at the short story. And along with Henrik Ibsen, uh, and probably on August Strindberg, the founder or father of contemporary modern drama. Uh, and he practiced medicine. He did a great amount of public health work. And he did all of this before dying at the age of 44. Uh, he has over 400 published stories, by the way. Um, but in that same evaluation uh, of, by Dr. Chekhov's preceptor, he said, the mental state of the patient interested him particularly, as well as traditional medicines. He attached great significance to the effect the doctor had on the psyche of the patient and on his way of life. And my own mentor, uh, well, so medical language can be healing, but it can also harm. And I, one of the big issues today is that since perhaps we don't <coughs> appreciate the healing power of words, that we often inadvertently use our words to harm patients. And one of my mentors, Eric Cassell, wrote, sticks and stones can break your bones, but a word can kill you. Um, and we're all familiar with phrases and words that we use in medicine that are common, but that actually harm patients. I'd like to read one more poem that um, shows how important words can be. And this is a poem in which the words that are about to be said could be very harmful to the patient if said in the wrong way, but also they could initiate a healing process if said in the right way. And this poem is called The Words. For the third time this month, his bronzed face sits with its swaggering list of what he needs me for, the test he read about in Sunday's Times, a second script for Percocet in case the pain that's almost gone comes back, why his appetite is shot, whether a drink at night would do him good. That body bears the ear ears with regal grace. His face is Olympian. His face is Olympian, commanding and ageless. The father of the gods assumes the form of a broker in futures on his way to the club. That immaculate, sun-drenched chest almost tugs me to his feet to learn the secret of success. But I hold fast. That newest test won't help either of us, nor will the trip to a clinic in Texas, no matter how famous. I want to escape to the next room, to leave him with his power and run for mine. The words that cut to his core, behold the pancreas. He looks at me with faint unease, rising in the creases of his eyes. My words will make him mortal. He will die. When we look at other cultures and read anthropology and so forth about traditional medicine and so forth, we often agree that words can heal uh, in these other cultures. For example, in the Navajo culture, the Blessing Way is a very important healing ceremony. Uh, it's a seven-day healing ceremony. <coughs> This is a, a picture of a sand painting being made in the ceremonial hogan. 
And here's a picture of the Atali, or medicine man, uh, putting uh, clay mud on, on the patient. This is a pediatric patient, as you can see. And here is part of the enemy way chant. It's a little different ceremony, but I'll read it for you, this little excerpt. Today I will walk out. Today everything unnecessary will leave me. I will be as I was before, a cool breeze over my body. I will have a light body. I will be happy forever. Nothing, nothing will hinder me. In beauty, all day long may I walk. Through the returning seasons may I walk. On the trail marked with pollen may I walk. With dew about my feet may I walk. And if you, if you visualize a desert camp, an evening, a bonfire, a group of community of people, and you imagine the chant, it's, I think, easy for you to understand the effect of that chant on the emotions of the people, of the patient. It's easy to understand its effect on the limbic system and the neurohormones and so forth, if you want to translate it to our language. Um, and to say that, you know, perhaps these words are healing. And I think this is the kind of idea that Anatole Briard had in mind in his essay, Doctor Talk to Me. He's a, was a critic and writer for The New Yorker who uh, had extensive prostate cancer and wrote about his experience, his care experience with his doctors. He talks about the paradox at the heart of medicine because a doctor, like a writer, must have a voice of his own, something that conveys the timbre, the rhythm, the diction, the music of his humanity, and that compensates us for all the speechless machines. The doctor is a storyteller, and he can turn our lives into good or bad stories, regardless of the diagnosis. I'll leave you, finally, with another of these wonderful slides that shows the summaries of all these articles, uh, most of which are quite boring, uh, that tell you the different ways that language and the way we speak that language uh, can increase patient satisfaction, increase patient self-efficacy, increase hope, and all the other aspects that might constitute a healing process. And here's an example from one of my medical students that I think is more eloquent than all those studies. As we both sat next to her, Dr. M's words were comforting and deliberate walking the patient through exactly what would occur. I was trying to recall those words, the phrasing, the body language that he used. They were words I could have said as well, but he just constructed them in such a way that put the patient at great ease. Someday, I say to myself, I'll be that smooth. And finally, um, to end on a positive note, these are two uh, excerpts. These are fourth year students, maybe two months or three months before graduation. I never thought I would say such a thing. I'm going to miss medical school. It has been such a wonderful experience for me, although painful at times. It's a privilege to pursue a career that you love. And this is the one that I, as a poet, <laughs> appreciate most. The practice of medicine is simply poetry in motion. 
The art of medicine is the validation of everything that makes the human experience. I learned more about myself than I ever imagined. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jack. And I think from listening to you, we've all gained a great deal. Um, now is the time in the program when you all can bring your questions, your comments, um, your thoughts uh, into, this, into this community. Um, you may address Jack, you may talk with um, each other, have a microphone here, and um, John will, would you be able to run the other mic on the other aisle? That would be great. Um, we'd ask that when you um, ask a question or make a comment, please um, identify yourself. And, um, so the floor is now yours. Bob Chevalier in Pediatrics. What are your personal recommendations for delivering bad news to the patient? I think you gave an example of how you can ruin a patient, the rest of a patient's life, by saying the wrong things. What is the process of getting tuned into the patient and delivering the bad news? Because I think often physicians are loath to uh, to confront the patient with the bad news. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I kind of um, I think first of all, honesty is paramount. Uh, I think vague or technical language is inappropriate. And so I would always uh, prepare, well, for, first of all, you prepare the situation. You're not talking on the phone, you don't have a pager on, etc. You're in a room, preferably with somebody of the patient's choice uh, with them, if they decide to have that person. Uh, I would tell them that I have bad news, and I would tell them right out what that news is in clear, simple, and ambiguous information, language. I would then allow time for the emotions to be expressed, and I think this is one area where we're, we're deficient, and that is isolating the cognitive aspect of this from the affective aspect. You expect emotions, and um, you encourage emotional responses to them. I would describe again, in clear step-by-step -step terms what the next step is, what needs to be done, but not in global words, you know, not, not in terms of, okay, we'll do this, we'll do that, then we'll consider therapy and so forth. We'll take the next step, which might involve further studies and so forth. Uh, I would always explain to the patient that I'm sticking with them and that we're going to work on this together. And I would emphasize my accessibility by phone or email, well, nowadays email. Uh, and I would always schedule a return appointment fairly quickly. Those are some of the things. Thank you. Hey, Brett Kane in Pediatrics, if, for, <laughs> forgive a lighter question. Uh, do you think improv is a, a valuable training for physicians to learn to become good listeners and to be improv. in the moment? I do. I do. Uh, I think improv, um, and whether that's a formal kind of thing with standardized patients, you know, and being observed and then reviewed, reviewing the tapes or reviewing uh, the interaction. 
or whether it's uh, literal improv uh, in a small group. Uh, I think both are important. Um, one of the things that I, I emphasize, because I am a poet and I do reflective writing, uh, a lot of, I mean, poetry is not the most I mean, it's not like football or something. It's not the most, uh, the pastime that is most uh, popular in the United States. So I emphasize that there are many paths to mindfulness. There are many paths to reflection. And you have to find the path that fits you. Uh, but, I think our responsibility as medical educators is to suggest a few paths and get, you know, have them have a little experience with them to see what does fit. My name is Yolanda. I'm a nurse coordinator in oncology. In comment to the first question, I think one thing that we forget is that the patient often already knows the bad news. Sure. Maybe you don't see it at the superficial level or he hasn't or she hasn't expressed it at the superficial level. But often the bad news is not so much of a surprise as we fear it will be. I think that's true. But I also think that verbalizing adds a new dimension to that and that many patients fear that. They may know it, but they don't want to hear it. Do you, do you think it's true, too, from a conversation like that, that the patient can then learn some of the ways that they might verbalize this information to other people who yes. know they've been ill or, or whatever, but that it really helps them yes. rehearse and, yes. and know how to, how to say this? I do, and I, we have to realize that in this kind of situation, really in many, any serious medical interaction, but especially in this kind of interaction, uh, the patient is only going to remember a certain amount, okay? And so you do want to be clear, and you want to use very, uh, understandable language, but at the same time, you can't expect that the patient will remember everything you say. And so that's why I think it's important to uh, encourage the patient, not only to ask questions then, but to emphasize your availability specifically to answer their questions and not wait to some hypothetical return visit, but to be available to them by phone or by other means, so that they might feel more comfortable in, in returning to that, because they're not going to remember. Hi, um, my name is Jillian Gardner. I'm a medical scribe in the ER. And my question is, how would you suggest that those of us who can't actively participate in patient contact, patient care, um, help to facilitate a better experience and all of the principles and ideals that you were just explaining to us? Who you don't actively participate in patient care. Or so I, I can't touch the patient. I can't actually interview them myself. So I'm taking notes and writing up the chart. After the fact. And you're taking notes from? From the physician's interview. From so I go into the room with the physician and they interview the patient. I take notes and then I write up the medical chart after. How do you think you can do it? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think I've been doing this for a few years now and I kind of noticed that I try to focus on the patient myself, even though I'm not the one speaking to them, I think, uh, and I also train people. So, for instance, I noticed one person I was training was kind of twirling her hair, and I, I feel like those actions 
tend to make the patient think that you're a little bored with them or this is very routine. Um, but I was just, I don't know, I guess kind of wondering, like, what can I do to either alleviate the physician's burden or mm -hmm. make the patient's experience better? Well, this is, this is new to me, so I'm just speaking here entirely off the hook, not, not off the hook, but off uh, ad lib. Um, I think it would depend on how comfortable you are with your physicians. Uh, I can I can imagine you asking the physician some gentle questions about had he or she noticed this or had you noticed that, um, which I think would be perfectly appropriate, like the twirling symptom, uh, because you're a good observer and a good listener. So perhaps in a non-threatening way to, to point these things out indirectly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we're Just one quick question. One quick follow up. I thought that was a good question. Yeah. Um, we often forget how to say welcoming things and behave like we're welcoming, and your body language can go far to make the patient and the family feel welcome. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank Jack Coolahan and thank all of you for being here. Please join us next Wednesday. We will have a program called Doctors as Makers. Uh, with uh, Dr. Jay Baruch from Brown University's Warren Albert School of Medicine. And please join us then. Again, thanks to Jack Coolingham.